Yeah, I mean, this horse is tearing a line apart. We can kind of assume that he's also a hero in this story. Yeah, like, that's impressive. I think anyone would want a horse like this. Everyone except for maybe Rostam, because when he woke up from his nap, he was quite angry with his horse. And he told him, Who told you to fight with lions? If you were to die, how would I get to save the king? You never think about these things. Excuse me? You have a cool yeah. horse willing to fight a lion and you scold it? <laughs> Greetings, travelers. Welcome back to Tales from the Enchanted Forest with your animal companions, Fox and Sparrow. For those of you just joining us, welcome, and we are so glad you are joining us for this series on heroes. Yeah, so Fox and I were talking, we thought we just need a hero, and we were holding out for a hero till the edge of the night. He's gotta be strong, he's gotta be fast, and he's gotta be larger than life, and fresh from the fight. I need a hero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so our previous episode kicked off our trilogy on the Shaname, or Book of Kings, which is an epic written by Ferdosi on the history of Iran's greatest kings and heroes. We last spoke of the hero Sam and his son Zal, so if you are interested in knowing more about those two, then make sure to circle back to our previous episode. However, it is not necessary to listen to that episode because we will be continuing on to the story of their grandson and son, Rostam, today. Or we're skipping all the uninteresting bits of their lives and going straight to the cooler son and grandson's life of Rostam. Yeah, while those two are known as great heroes, Rostam is the archetypal Iranian hero, and he does predate the Shahnameh as a long-standing folk hero as well. You can see him listed among the greatest literary heroes, which include Gilgamesh, Beowulf, Achilles, Odysseus, and San Wukong. Ooh, elite list indeed. So without further ado, we present The Trials of Rostam. When we last left off, our love-struck hero Zal had finally gone his happily ever after with the princess Rudaba. This second chapter is titled Rostam, the son of Zal Dostan, because Rudaba was pregnant. Her baby was the one that we heard prophecies about in our last episode, and part of the reason why her marriage to Zal was approved. Her son, her little lion cub, however, would simply not be born. She grew sick and weary as her due date came and went. Uh, did she not just try eating spicy food? I hear that helps induce labor. No idea why, but, you know, that's the old wives saying. Old wives tale. <laughs> old wives say. Old wives. <laughs> <laughs> that caught me off guard. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, because I had wrote, but that's what people say. And then I was like, but it's an old wives tale. And I just smooshed, smooshed it together. I think at this point, she wouldn't want the baby to be born naturally or induce labor because he was so big. Oh, he was called a mammoth baby, and he was still inside her, so you can only wonder how big she got. Yeesh. At that point, you're kind of thinking, you don't really want a natural birth. So, wow, that is some some late point she got to. This isn't just a one weaker type deal. No, this is like, get this baby out of me, I'm dying. Yeesh, I feel really bad for her. Yeah. Remind me, um, how did these prophecies come about? Was it star reading, where we were getting like tea leaves going? Or was it like an old mysterious book written by a man and cloaked in black? Where are these coming from? So the prophecies that we heard about last time, they were written by the astrologers for both the king and for Sam, who looked into the future. And what they did is they looked at stars, they looked at the horoscopes of both uh, Zal and Rudaba. And there was a really big issue because if we remember, Rudaba's father... Mm -hmm is descendant from demons. Right. And Zal was raised by the Simur. So people were really concerned about what kind of child they would have. But all of the prophecies all came to the same conclusion that their son would be the greatest hero of Iran. Okay, so it was like stars. Mostly stars, I think. Okay, okay. Just just trying to figure out what flavor <laughs> or genre of prophecies we were going with. Which chosen one prophecy are we going with? <laughs> there, I mean, there's different methods and all of them have different little asterisks next to it like well yes but could change with the stars or yes but like tea leaves are every day or we don't know where the book came from but we just know it's legit you know i just just try to <laughs> we turn to page 253 and all of a sudden it says you're gonna be a hero i mean hey if, uh, if it's true you just don't know and you just don't know why people are believing it but just good to know stars 
stars go back a long ways in terms of being um, prophecies and stuff. So, okay. I, I understand where we're going with this. I'm here for it. So we have our hero, our chosen one, so to say. I need a hero. But he simply would not be born. Ugh. And when Zal saw the state of his wife, he took one of the two feathers the Simurgh had given him and burnt it to summon his mythical mother. Immediately, the bird set about her work and ordered Zal to bring her a glittering knife, a man familiar with spells, and enough wine to get Rudaba drunk. She then instructed Zal on how to perform what we would call a caesarean section and how to take care of Rudaba afterwards. And with her medical knowledge imparted, she disappeared again. Okay, does the simmer have any idea how bad that alcohol would have been for the baby? All the alcohol goes straight to the baby's brain? And they aren't even allowed to drink until they are, like, 18 years old. Like, this is breaking some rules here. Well, I don't think it really matters just because she's literally about to give birth. So there wouldn't really be enough time to have any kind of alcohol go to the baby, really. And I think more so is just to make sure that she was, you know, intoxicated enough that she wouldn't feel the pain. Because I doubt they had strong painkillers or epidurals and stuff like that. So I'm not too worried about Rostam. Well, okay, Rostam might be, like, a super cool baby, but I don't think the Simmer is uh, making a good example of what we should do going forward. That could sound still dangerous. Actually, I think alcohol was used quite often when it came to surgical procedures. And the Simmer, actually, there was a quite an interesting paper I read when doing research for this episode about how the Simmer is a great herald in these stories when it comes to medical expertise. And we see her again later in the story of Rostam. Um, and how she imparts surgical advice, and how she imparts kind of medical wisdom. So I'm on Team Simmer here. Okay, okay, okay. But I think the board should review her medical license is all I'm saying. (laughs) Times were different. Everyone got drunk before surgery. Yeah, well, good for her. This sounds like a really annoying baby, so let's get him out. Let's see what (laughs) he has to say about the world, and what a great hero he's going to be. So everyone waited apprehensively as Zal and the priest went ahead as instructed. They brought the magnificent baby into the world painlessly and named him Rostam. This epic as a whole has pushed the envelope for a lot of things, but this, this to me seems like a stretch. The birth being painless? I'm, I'm, I can't help but start to wonder if this isn't actually historically accurate. Like, I don't know. I want to believe you, but this is the thing that pushes me over the edge here. <laughs> Not the dragons? No, dragons, yeah, that, that's normal. That's legit. Like, mythical monsters, yeah, of course. But, like, a painless birth, like, if you want me to believe what you're writing, you got to have some accuracy going on into this. <laughs> some believability. I'm sure, you know, the dragons, the demons, all of those kind of stuff would have something to say about the historical accuracy of this. I say it as a joke, but I legit, these are the little <laughs> things that would take me out of a story, not like the big grandiose stuff. <laughs> You're like, oh no, she didn't face any any pain while giving birth to this huge mammoth child. It's like, hmm, <sighs> how much did you drink? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably a lot. Yeah. She was being cut open after all. Again, it also would have gone to the baby first, so she would have had to get the baby drunk and then herself drunk in order to be truly drunk. (laughs) Well, from his birth, Rostam was a strange child. He was a child on the edge. He was born in Kabul, which at the time was considered to be part of India, so he was on the edge of the Iranian Empire. He was also born to a father raised by a magical bird and a mother who was a descendant of demons. His birth itself also required magical intervention from the Simurgh, This theme of being constantly on the edge of two worlds will follow Rostam throughout, and we will see magical elements come to pass in his stories. However, while his background was kind of sketchy, he himself was nothing but perfect. As the boy grew, he became well known for his noble stature and strength. Sam and Zal were both in awe of the boy, as was Mehrab, Rudaba's father and the descendant of the Zeman Zahak. Unfortunately, as the wine flowed freely one night, Mehrab confidently pro- proclaimed that Sam and Zal were worthless and Rostam was his hero alone. They would renew Zahak's power and then everyone would bow before them. No one really took this seriously, so we will have to leave Mehrab to do his Jafar like villain splaining on his own. And actually, nothing really came of that. <laughs> he was just like, mm, not my hero. This guy is my hero. He's like my grandson. Yeah, the demon's grandson. We're, we're in this together. Yeah, we're cool. 
Around this time, if you guys remember King Manucher, he was given the news from his astrologers that he was going to die soon. And so he began making preparations for his son, Nazar, to take his place. And when I say the astrologers told him he was going to die soon, I literally mean they looked at the stars and said, yep, we don't see anything in your future, so we think you're going to die. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Before he passed, he told his son a little prophecy, that the Turks would wage war against Persia soon, and they would break Nazar's army. He told his son to always stay in God's way, because both good and bad will come from him. As it turns out, his father had prophesied correctly, and the next few years would be filled with war between the Turks, also known as Durians, and the Persians. For time's sake, and not to bore you with 400 names and 400 locations, we will skip this part, but you can read about it in the show notes for this episode. It mostly involves Zal and Mehrab anyway, along with another host of heroes, and Rostam only really appears towards the end, when the Turanian prince, Afrasaib, goes back on his word for peace and tries to take over Persia again. If this were a movie, this would be when we power through a musical montage of people, places, and war just happening in a miscellaneous order. If it was a Disney movie, I suppose it'd be like a really- Zero to hero kind of montage, I think. Zero to hero, just like that. Zero to hero. Yeah, I mean, during this time, Rossum's not really part of the war. He's kind of just growing up because he's, you know, a child. But we hear a lot about Zal, so if you are interested to know more about that and to know more about kind of the succession and the political structure and all of that, do recommend the book. Now for Rostam himself, his hero arcs throughout the Shahnameh are extensive and interlaced with those of other kings and those of his father Zal. So to keep it streamlined, we're going to focus on two aspects of his heroism and his historic tales. The first is the story of how he got his horse, Rakish, and the second will be his infamous Afghan, or Seven Labors. So the landscape of Iran at the moment is that they are in heavy warfare against the Turk invaders. With his father's summons, Rostam prepared to fight and declared that he would need to don his leopard skin and acquire a new horse to ride into battle. Just a note on his infamous leopard skin, or panther skin, it has kind of a dodgy history depending on what version of the tale you read. Some versions say that his leopard skin was actually a dragon skin from the time he fought a dragon at the age of 15. Others say the Simurgh had hidden the armor and given it to him before his seven labors, and others just say that it was something that just appeared. <laughs> Quality of the armor is also different depending on where you read about it. In some stories, it's like a magical armor resistant to water, fire, and weapon damage, which is similar to the protective animal skins of Gilgamesh and Hercules, and in others, it's just a ceremonial leopard skin. Either way, sounds dope. I mean, it is. <laughs> Riding into battle with this leopard skin, a big mace, you know, the fastest stallion around yep. the world. Is, it's kind of like he has a look. He has a very distinct, I am a hero and I am coming in to fight an army single-handedly and I will take them all down kind of vibe. And this is what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, Rostam is very much, he plays into that kind of larger than life hero where people hear his name or see him approaching and they kind of start to flee. One thing I really appreciate about the Shaname is that there's kind of like a realistic element in it in the fact that when people see someone stronger or a hero approaching or they see one of their commanders die, they do flee. They don't just keep fighting, which is something I think is quite unrealistic when you have a bunch of poor people as your army. They're not going to stay and fight if they think they're not going to win or if the chances of death are suddenly very, very great. <laughs> um, so I, I always like that imagery of like people just being like, right, this is too much. We're going to go now. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the guard from Iron Man 3, the moment he sees Iron Man beat up all the other guards and Tony finally turns on him, he just puts his hands up in the air. He's like, I don't want to even be here anyways. He's crazy. Like, I don't get paid enough to do this. Like, he just, like, walks off. Yeah, I mean, I that's a, that's a trope I can fully get behind. 100%. Like, people going, I don't get paid enough to deal with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, okay? I'm just going to go. It, it didn't work yesterday when my D D group suddenly decided not to do the quest because they're like we're not getting paid enough to deal with this bye and i was like no please come back <laughs> that's the problem with D D because sometimes you just go mm, don't really want to do that that sounds hard i appreciate the enemy just going yep nope i know when to bounce i'm good yep i'm good i'm go now mm -hmm. so Rostam is now looking for his noble steed, his animal sidekick, the donkey to his Shrek. Mm -hmm. And so horses of all sizes and strengths were brought before him. But every time he tried to put his weight on the horse, it buckled under his strength. He tried and failed to find his horse until he came across a beautiful mare from Kabul with her fowl. 
Before Rostam could claim her, the herdsman warned him that for the past three years, no noble had been able to tame the horse, with its lion-like mother scaring them off every time. Rostam paid no mind and caught the fowl. When the mother charged at him, he roared at her, sending her galloping away to the rest of her herd. The horse he chose was strong enough to bear his weight as if it was nothing at all. And so Rostam and his horse, Rakish, began their journey together. The image of a guy just roaring at a horse until it was so scared it ran away is just super hilarious to me. Like, presumably other nobles tried other methods of intimidation, but I doubt they tried to roar. But no, it's just, it's really silly. (laughs) What else do you think they tried? (laughs) I'm sure they tried to, like, separate them or try and take the fowl away from the mum for a bit and wean them away. But some horses, like, specifically wild horses as well, are very temperamental. And if you don't, like, if a horse doesn't want to be tamed, it becomes very difficult to try and keep it up. Because if they keep, you know, kicking you off their back or they keep running away or rearing when you try and mount them, it almost becomes not worth the hassle. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. It's like... Horses in fiction are very different from real horses. Well, Rakesh is actually quite an interesting horse. He has the ability to kind of communicate with Rostam. He is one of the greatest horses in the Shaname specifically. And he does kind of take on this sidekick character to Rostam throughout his adventures. And they become kind of known in conjunction to each other. But speaking of roars, did you know that the iconic Lion King roar was not actually from a lion? It was actually produced by an American voice actor, Frank Welker, screaming and growling into a metal trash can. I wonder if he would have been more intimidating than Rostam. I don't think so. Rostam was like a pretty big guy. <laughs> yes, but we're talking about a professional voice actor and a trash can. I That could be terrifying. <laughs> I think both. But if we're talking about, you know, hero larger than life Rostam, I think he can give off a pretty good growl or roar or something. Although... It's more of a chuff, isn't it, that lines do. So either way, it was good enough to scare a horse. Yes, yes. Put that in your resume. With his new steed in hand, Rostam rode off to battle the Turins. And during his first day of battle, he fought like a madman. And what is literally my favorite description of a fight ever, he located King Afrasaib, struck his saddle with his mace, and then lifted the king over his head by the belt. There's an excellent manuscript miniature of this moment, and we'll put it on the website. But I just love the idea of this young, kind of unknown warrior just showing up and lifting the king over his head. The ancient equivalent to, do you even lift, bro? (laughs) Well, to add to the humor, the king's belt snapped and he fell to the ground. And it wasn't until after the, uh, the Turks rescued their king that Rostam started cursing himself and realized that he should have just tucked the man under his arm and rode off instead. Literally, what a big power move. (laughs) And it was an overall power move because news of his brash and fierceness in battle strengthened the Persians' resolve, and they won a stunning victory against the Turks who fled. A new Persian king, Kay Kobad, was installed, and he achieved peace with the Turks and drafted a new agreement. Basically, got an awesome new horse, humiliated king, and installed a new puppet ruler, and just called it a day. Seems like a good day. It wasn't actually him who installed Kay Kobad as the new Persian king. And this is quite an important distinction to make because the first time that Rostam actually installs a new king is going to be later on in the story. And from then on, it's kind of a signal of him kind of separating from his father and separating from the idea of him being Zal's son and being his own hero as Rostam. So I would say the new king was installed by the nobles and more so by Zal. Okay. And less so by Rostam, who at this point was more so known for just being a fierce mammoth warrior, kind of this all brawn, no brain type guy. Oh, right. I love these characters. They're always fun to to follow around. They just hit things really well. Yes. Now we're going to jump forward a hundred years to his son's reign, King K. Kavus. During this time, Rostam grew from a young boy to a young adult. You might be thinking, he's a hundred. Surely he's an old man. That would be correct if time worked the same way for the heroes and kings as it did for others. Rostam and Zal, as well as other heroes in the Shaname, live long, fruitful lives. Rostam will live up to being 600 years old. Now, at the time of his death, Zal is still alive. So in relation to his overall age, Rostam is really still in his youth. If we think about fantasy races, like elves and dwarves, they all age differently to humans. 
So Rostam is still technically a late teenager, early adult here. Now, back to the king. King Kay Kavus, as it usually goes with kings, was not his father's equal, and quickly became a man after glory and power. So it's no surprise that a demon was able to trick him very easily. The demon, disguised as a musician, sang about his country of Mahazon Doran, which was a paradise on earth and home to demons. Keikovus thought it would be a splendid idea to conquer these lands and plunder them for all their treasures. Saul and the other nobles tried to advise him, but the king refused to listen and took his army to the home of the demons. Plot twist, the demons and the king of Mahazon Daron did not appreciate having their lands plundered and captured the army with their champion, the white demon. Instead of killing the Persians, the white demon delighted in torturing them, and so he took away their sight and kept them trapped in a castle. How deluded are you when you think taking on an army of demons is a good thing? That just seems trouble to me. There's always kind of this imagery of a father and son. and It's like a cycle. So you have a good father, a bad son. And then you have a good son, a bad father. And so I think, and it's not necessarily bad in terms of evil and good. It's just sometimes the morals are different. Sometimes the goals are different. And so as a king, he obviously thinks more of himself than his predecessor did. So he thinks that he deserves everything in the world. He's kind of this arrogant man. Ugh, spoiled and rich kid. it almost always does come about that the fathers who fight the wars bear sons who are kind of soft mm. and arrogant and then they get plunged into a new war and so their sons have to become wartime leaders and then their sons are soft leaders and so it keeps going it's a never-ending cycle and in this case obviously he thinks that he's he deserves all these pleasures he deserves all these riches these women and the way he goes about it is quite cruel he does order his men to kind of go about and kind of slaughter whoever they see and so i'm kind of on team white demon here but you know, <laughs> rostam and zal are the champions of the kings so they do have to kind of go protect the persians oh man i guess it's in their contract so what are you gonna <laughs> do can't break that there's a find i think associated with it Yeah, well, this is where Rostam becomes kind of a strange hero because he has this loyalty that he has to show to the crown. And later on in his life, he does start to question a bit. He does start to pull away. But at this time, it's very much the highest kind of duty as a hero, as, you know, the subject of a king is to have his back, even if it's not the right king, even if he's, you know, not doing the right thing, Mm -hmm. it is your duty to make sure he goes back on the right path. And so you see Zal, you see Rostam kind of in the past discussing things with the king, trying to make him see the light, trying to make him understand. Um, But it's it's kind of like the divine right to rule. They kind of go with it because it's God's will. So when Zal and Rostam heard of this news that they tried to prevent, they were annoyed. But being the heroes they are, Zal did send his son off on a quest to save the king. And during this quest is when he faces his infamous seven trials. There are only two ways to get to Mazondaron, and Rostam took the quickest path, which was also the most dangerous. The first trial came on the second day of his journey, when he grew hungry enough to rest. Rostam missed his Boy Scouts camping manual because the place he chose to rest after hunting was a lion's den. When the lion came home from his hunt, he was equally as confused to see a massive warrior in his bed. Deciding to make a light meal out of them, he charged at Rakesh first, thinking it would be an easy move, but instead, the horse reared and slammed his hooves on the lion's head before tearing the lion into pieces with his teeth. Ugh. I personally have never seen a horse with teeth sharp enough to do this, but we love a good kind of mythical horse sidekick. Uh, agreed, and I also want to give props to this horse, because Normally, horses are just relegated to being the mode of transportation. So it's nice, like, this cool horse breaking the mold and, like, getting a bigger roll and he's got weird, (laughs) sharp teeth. Like, you know, he's using what he's got to his advantage. Yeah, I mean, this horse is tearing a lion apart. We can kind of assume that he's also a hero in this story. Yeah, like, that's impressive. I think anyone would want a horse like this. Everyone except for maybe Rostam, because when he woke up from his nap... He was quite angry with his horse, and he told him, Who told you to fight with lions? If you were to die, how would I get to save the king? You never think about these things. Excuse me? You have a cool yeah. horse willing to fight a lion and you scold it? Just just get out, dude. Get out. I don't want you anymore. 
let the let the horse be the hero of the story and just ugh. Dude. Yeah, in these beginning parts, Rostam is like, I mean, he's still a teenager. So to some extent, we can be like, right, teenagers aren't the greatest of people anyway. But he he doesn't really, I think, fully appreciate his horse who, you know, could have run away. So there was that. But I think they do start to create a bond later on and they do become kind of inseparable and they have kind of this great empathy for each other. But in the, this beginning part, it's... It is a bit silly, I think, that Rostam wakes up from his nap and he goes, you know, who told you to fight with lions? Like, you should have just woken me up. I would could have done it, you know? I want the experience points, man. You can't just go beating those things up. <laughs> Gosh. Yes. Not like the lion would have come for me afterwards and got a nice surprise round. <laughs> After scolding his horse, he went back to sleep. And the next day, the two headed off. But they had no luck finding any water. They were both getting weary and desperate. Rostam dismounted and began wandering like a madman, praying to God for aid, until at last he saw a ram run by. Taking it as a sign of God, he followed the creature a distance to a spring, where he rested after warning his horse not to get into any fights with lions or demons. So this is technically the second trial, and it may seem like a bit of a wash, but it helps reinforce the imagery of Rostam as a religious hero who ultimately puts his trust in fate. And then, you know, the third task does make up for it because we finally get to meet a dragon and not just hear about it in stories. Yes! I hope it's a tough, fire-breathing dragon and not, like, a answer-me-these-riddles-three type dragon. I, I want to I hear him fighting. Oh, no, this is, this is definitely a fire-breathing dragon. Woot! And you'll never guess it, but once again, Rostam had chosen to fall asleep in the lair of a creature. And it had fallen asleep in the lair of a dragon. Although, to be fair, this wasn't like a regular dragon lair where it looked like a dragon lair with gold and a cave and kind of murky and on top of a mountain. It was just right next to the river. Flying overhead, the dragon was returning from a hunt. And he spotted Rostam and this horse. He began wondering who had the nerve to just climb into his bed of reeds. Ever vigilant, Rakish spotted the creature and tried to wake Rostam at once. However, the dragon was very cunning and made himself invisible, so that when Rostam looked up at the sky, he saw nothing in the darkness and fell asleep again. I mean, this is the same hero who claimed he would not leave his horse's back and ride straight to save the king, and he takes lots of naps. Gosh, man. Anyway, Rakish was getting quite annoyed, because he could see a fire-breathing dragon up ahead, and his great hero just kept falling asleep. So channeling his inner horse from Tangled, he stomped on Rostam's pillow, waking the fearsome hero. Again, the hero grumbled and threatened to cut off the horse's legs if he was bothered again, and just promptly fell asleep. Now, the horse was kind of stuck between his fear of the fire-breathing dragon and his loyalty to Rostam, so he didn't know whether to run or to stay and fight. <laughs> this horse is way too good for Rostam, the sleeping beauty hero guy. And honestly, he should ditch him at this point. It feels like Rockish is solving these challenges anyways, so maybe Rockish was the true hero all along? Yeah, this is kind of where people tend to, like, think of Rostam and go, that guy's not the nicest dude right now. Mm. Threatening to cut off your horse's feet, not listening to him, not taking danger seriously, valuing your sleep over, you know, the sense of danger. It does kind of make you question his heroic abilities. Yep. I like a good nap just as much as anybody else, but, like, sometimes when you have to fight a dragon, you just have to fight a dragon, and that's all there is to it. Yes. <laughs> also, why would you threaten to cut off your horse's legs? Like, wasn't the whole point that he couldn't fight the, the lion, because what if he died, then there would have no mount? Like, it feels like the same thing. It's not like he'd go very far without legs. <laughs> Yeah, he's rolling nat ones on animal handling. Animal handling, perception, just <laughs> staying awake. No. It's, it's a mess right now. But luckily for him, Rakish was fiercely loyal. And so he reared at the ground again, and this time made sure Rostam woke up. And, with the luck of God, Rostam saw the dragon and jumped up. Rostam and his horse fought side by side, slashing and tearing until the dragon was nothing but a stream of blood. Rostam was quite horrified at his kill, and after praying and cleansing, he rode away, taking nothing from the dragon. He rode for a long time, not stopping for any food, until he came upon what looked like a deserted feast. Hungry and used to such comforts, Rostam made himself right at home, 
he picked up a nearby timbre and composed his own version of Rostam of Rivia, his own little song about his heroic deeds. A pretty cool fourth task. These tasks feel super uneven. One of them is fighting a literal dragon, and the other is just eating some good food. Did Monty Python write this? So I think the biggest issue is that when we think of labors and we think of tasks, we often think about Hercules. And Rossum's trials themselves are often compared to Hercules' trials. But the two are just vastly different in that Hercules was seeking out specific tasks assigned by him by King Eurystheus in order to cleanse his blood crime. Rostam, on the other hand, is going on a journey to save his king. So these tasks are coming up as they do. The scale of the tasks can be seen as a metaphorical or spiritual commentary, kind of on his relationship with his father, his coming of age, and his own role as a hero. In fact, the focus on his trials and the idea of sleep coming up repeatedly gives the entire sequence a dreamlike quality. And so we're often left confused by the big events mixed with the small events, but they often all do mean something greater. So for example, the one with finding water, it kind of relied on him trusting the will of God and fate and following the ram to the spring. The fight with the dragon was a huge kind of trust in his horse and building that bond with his horse. And then we have this feast where he, as you'll see, it's about a trick and it's about praising God. So there are lots of religious elements to his trials. Mm. And it does always come back to the idea of God will give you good things as well as bad things. And you have to take them both. So we kind of have to stop thinking about the tasks as things that were assigned to him or things that are proving strength or proving his heroism. They're just parts of his journey more like his coming of age journey because at this point he's still a teenager he's still trying to figure out who he is away from his grandfather away from his father and kind of this legacy of heroism that's been given to him so he's trying to create the idea of what kind of hero he's going to be and so we see this in both his goodness his strength his trust but also in kind of his annoyance um his tendency to want to sleep a lot his tendency to kind of ignore things sometimes his tendency to just kind of go straight into, I'm going to fight and kill this thing. And so I personally prefer the way these trials have been laid out and the fact they're not all just strength. They're not all just go and get this thing or solve this thing. They're just there. They're part of his adventure. So back to his fairy feast, as he's playing his music, it caught the attention of one of the witches who had created this magical dinner. She was curious, so she disguised herself as a young maid and went to go sit with him. Rostam, you know, young, sweet Rostam, was just overjoyed at God's gifts to him and began praising God. And so he gave the witch a toast. But the witch, who was a vessel of Ahriman, the demon, could not keep her disguise up and her true form was revealed. Rostam was quite horrified, so he slashed at her, killed her, and moved on. His happen chance feast was forgotten. Another trope is checked off our trope bingo of don't take random picnics when you see them in the forest. They might belong to fairies or witches. Mm -hmm. I'm actually surprised that he didn't decide to take a nap after that feast. Just his track record would tell me otherwise. (laughs) Well, I think we can see his growth just in the amount of naps he's taking. Good job, Rostin. Proud of you. Sort of. Not really, but okay. Go on. (laughs) Spooked. He rode on until he reached a place where there was nothing but darkness in the sky and wheat in the fields. And we were talking about character growth. He decides to take another one of his infamous naps. But this time, he was spotted by an angry farmhand who was furious at these two trespassers just laying in their field. Instead of dealing with the man calmly, Rostam cut off his ears. The injured man ran back to his master, the great hero of Mazandaran, Olad who went to confront Rostam with his men. Rostam easily handled the men, and when he chased Olad down, he made him a deal. He would spare the man if the hero would tell him how to get to the white demon. Now, Olad was kind of like, this is crazy, but he decided to give him a description anyway. The lands that Rostam was traveling to were unforgiving and perilous. Yet, Rostam just laughed and said, lead the way. On their way to rescue the king, they came across the demon army of Arzang and Rostam wasted no time in riding into a camp full of demons, riding straight for their master, and then literally ripping his head off, like grabbing hold of his ear and his shoulder and just yanking. 
the other demons were actually quite afraid of this because this man had just rode in and ripped someone's head off without even blinking. Mm -hmm. So they began fleeing while Rostam slaughtered everyone in his path. Eventually, he and Olad reached the trapped Persians. The king, who was blind and helpless, had somehow learned about the white demon's whereabouts, and he instructed Rostam to cross seven mountains until he reached a cave filled with warrior demons. If Rostam could kill the white demon and bring them his blood, one of the doctors said that their eyesight would be healed. Seems legit. Again, questionable medicine practicing, but you know. I wonder what WebMD would say about that. <laughs> that they're all going to die soon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it were me, I'd be saving the Persians and getting out of there because they were the ones who caused this mess in the first place. But Rostam is a hero. And so for his seventh labor, he crossed the seven mountains with his captive sidekick, Olad, at his side and found the white demon. I'm surprised he didn't want to sleep on an important decision like that. I mean, I'm sure he would if he had gone to the demon's lair and just took a nap. Yeah. <laughs> but I do want to talk about the demon for a second because we did kind of skirt over his description quite a bit um, for the sake of time and for consistency. So the actual demon is quite a controversial image for scholars. One of the most popular theories is that the white demon either represents a white race of man or a white deity from the north. However, scholars like Mahmoud Omid Salar focus on the fact that the white demon is an Oedipal complex, and the white demon represents his albino father Zal. Rostam overcomes his father's position and power, and this story is a coming-of-age task for Rostam to discover his own identity away from that of his lineage. Omid Salar goes on to use the fact that Fredosi begins the chapter on Rostam's trials by mentioning that this upcoming poem was about fathers and sons and their roles in each other's lives and demises. So Rostam has some daddy issues, as does Zal. So I guess it's a generational thing. Apparently, like father, like son. <laughs> Rostam slashed through the demons easily by waiting until they were asleep until he had conquered everything but the cave of the white demon. His heart was full of fear, and he stalled when he saw the massive body of the demon lying in the cave. It looked like a massive black mountain with white hair and iron armor. Before Rostam could move, the demon flew at him, and Rostam had no choice but to attack despite his fear. Jumping forward like a maddened elephant, he sliced through the demon's leg, but it didn't stop the demon, and the two fought relentlessly against each other. During their fight, Rostam thought to himself that if he survived this, then he would live forever, while the demon thought that if he survived this, he would never have any of his previous nobility of power, with his severed leg and ruined reputation. Rostam was able to get the upper hand and threw the demon to the ground, cutting out his heart and liver. In some versions, Rostam also cuts the demon's head and wears it as a helmet. Okay, first of all, ew. Second of all, it seems like a lot of work to rip off the head and then go through the head, taking out the brain and the flesh and like, it, it just seems like a lot of wasted effort to have an inefficient helmet. Third of all, ew. Yeah, it's kind of giving me that weird Leonardo DiCaprio movie where he climbs inside of a bear to keep warm kind of imagery. Oh, yeah, The Revenant? Where you, like, you understand maybe why it happened, but you're also kind of like, that's also really gross, and I can't imagine. Oh, maybe Rostam just won an Oscar, and that's all this was. Maybe. He's going to one-up Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, good luck with that. But a really good part about books like the Shaname and some of the other Persian epics is that they have lots of miniature paintings within them, within the original manuscripts, or in other manuscripts. So I will be linking some very interesting photos of Rostam with the demon head as a helmet um, on our website. So be sure to check those out because they're actually quite cool. Oh, as well as some images of Rakish because I think he is the hero we need. Yeah, he is the real hero of the story, no doubt. <laughs> so Rostam returned to his king and restored their sight and freed the warriors. Instead of kind of learning their lesson, King Cavus then took to sending a strange set of letters to the king of Mazandaron who did not appreciate the random threats. And so for a week, battle raged. On the eighth day, Rostam flung his spear at the king of Mazandaron. But instead of collapsing, the man used magic to transform himself into a granite rock. Granite? He did rock. Okay, I'll see myself out. <laughs> we always appreciate a good pun. Yep, yep, yep. That's what I'm here for. Tired of this sorcery, and quite frankly, probably tired of this war that shouldn't have happened and should have ended a long time ago, Rostam approached the granite and said that the king could either turn back or be hacked away with an axe. The king turned back, 
only for Rossum to tell the executioner to hack him to pieces anyway. So I guess that ends that chapter. And now we see the first of Rostam's kingmaker ways. Remember that guy that whose field he kind of trespassed on, whose farmhand he sliced the ears off of, and then whose men he killed? Yeah. Well, Olad had been kind of a begrudging sidekick along this entire trip. He kind of was tied up every now and then when Rostam went to go kill demons. But Rostam upheld his end of the bargain. So with the old king dead, Olad was made the king of Mazandaron and the Persians finally marched home. Woot. This story, however, does not end there, and there are a great many chapters that deal with Zal and Rostam saving the day, saving King Kavus once again. You know, a little love story for Rostam, a little bit of more war with the Turins, a little bit of more war here and there. However, we are going to leave off this story there, and for our final Shaname episode to close off our trilogy, we'll be exploring the story of Rostam's son, Sorab, and the eventual death of Rustam himself. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. But seriously, at, near the end of the, like, these trials, Rustam had the same energy of, mm, we didn't need this meeting, we could have just done this in an email, so can we wrap this up? Can I get going? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, it must be really hard trying to have this identity on your own, but you're always known as your father's son and your grandfather's grandchild, and then also... You're also known as, you know, a demon's great-grandson because that's on his mother's side. There's also all these expectations of being the chosen one, of being the hero, which does kind of go to his head. (laughs) But he has all these loyalties. And as I said in the very beginning, he is kind of on the edge of the empire, both spiritually and kind of mentally. Mm -hmm. Um, The kings during this this sequence aren't the greatest. We have really kind of short-lived kings who do great things, and we have kind of longer-term kings who are not the greatest and who keep getting forgiven and given chances over and over again. And a couple times, the nobles and the people do turn to Zal and say, you know, why can't you be our king? And he just kind of says, no, I'm not. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to be a king. I'm just the hero. How could you say that? How are you going against God's will? So it's very clear who's in charge and who isn't. And I think Rostam does struggle with that. And we'll see that kind of later on when his story kind of unfolds, that he does struggle with hierarchies and authorities and his own identity, really. But here we see the very first time that he got to go on his own quest and make his own name for himself. Yeah. And to his credit, like, he did actually do a number of things. He did fight a freaking dragon (laughs) and uh, a demon king. Whereas Zal, I mean, his whole shtick was, I want to marry this girl. Dad. (laughs) I want to marry her. Why aren't you letting me marry her? We had such an issue with Zal because we didn't really hear what he did. And the same with Sam. It wasn't until later on that Sam actually told us that he's a dragon slayer. But we were kind of like, why are you two heroes? Like, what is what is going on? Are you a romantic hero? Are you a trickster hero? Are you a noble hero? Like, what is, yeah. what is your purpose? Yeah. Like, did a lot of telling and not showing. So we were like, mm, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's really, you guys are really heroes. Rostam is the first one we've actually seen a fair amount of stuff, go, okay, you you were prophesized and you're starting to show it. Like, yeah, okay, I could see where that's coming from, that you're a hero. Yeah, Zal had a lot of letter writing. I think we took all, we took from that story. <laughs> yep, he wrote a letter once. No, his dad wrote the letter. It was Psalm that Yeah, did his that. dad wrote a letter. His mother-in-law wrote a letter. Some other people wrote a letter. The king wrote, everyone wrote letters and there was stargazing and astrology, but there wasn't a lot of, like, physical fighting. yeah or physical tests of strength, really. But, I mean, that's always the case with heroes. The only test of strength Zal had was the climbing up to the girl's tower with the, <laughs> the rope, which I refuse to believe he threw himself. And I think he was lying in that situation. I think he took the elevator. <laughs> the Simurk shows up, invisible, and she just kind of, she's like, all right, I'm going to just do this for him. Burns the second feather. But, yes, I think... When we're doing a series on heroes, it's so important that we talk about all the different types of heroes because they're not all just kind of cookie cutter. We have heroes like Achilles, where he's a bit of a whiny little guy. Um, We have heroes like Zal, who are more romantic heroes. They do things out of love. We have heroes like Rostam, who's just like the stereotypical Hercules type of hero who just goes there, does a bunch of stuff, kills a bunch of people. 
Um, but he's also more like the knights of the round table where like they're ordered to do things and they go off and they have this great loyalty to the crown, to the king. Threaten horses. So I think it's always interesting to see, you know, where our heroes are coming from and why we call them heroes. That's true. But I was excited to just finally have a dragon. <laughs> yes, right? Um, is this the first dragon that we've covered in the podcast? Um, I think it might be. We haven't really done dragons or anything kind of... Oh, wait, no, we did. I mean, if we're counting the bonus episode we did on Raya and the Last Dragon, we talked oh, about we, um, we talked about the Naga quite, you know, quite a lot there. And we talked about the kind of Chinese dragon, the Filipino dragons, mm-hmm. the South Asian dragons, just kind of all the different types of dragons cultures have. Yes. And we're going to we're going to continue to cover more as we talk about heroes because dragons are very cool. We could talk forever about dragons, honestly, and they show up everywhere. And they often come into these hero fights because the only way to make a person super, super cool in fantasy is to have them fight a dragon. Like, there's a lot of other things they can do, <laughs> but if you want to cement them as the coolest in your story, they have fought a dragon. And that's that's the bar. We love dragons. Mm-hmm. Anyway, travelers, that is the story of Rostam and his seven labors. If you want to see more of the story and some more about Saul and the succession of the kings, please do check out the blog post. It'll be a bit more in-depth on timelines and I promise you there will be family trees so we can kind of follow along. Yeah, and come back to us in a fortnight when we finish up our trilogy on these great heroes and figure out how Rostam's story ends. You can also join us anytime on Twitter or Instagram if you want to see some more folklore tidbits throughout the week. And if you are old school like Sparrow, you can always send us an email at talesfromtheenchantedforest at gmail.com so we can hear your questions, comments, and suggestions. And remember, travelers, if you enjoy this story or anything else we do here, please make sure to give us a review on any platform you use to listen to our podcast. A big shout out to Deostar, Not Banff, Biochem 1980, A Red Rose Thought. And thank you to all our listeners over on Good Pods for ranking us so that we are on the top ranking podcast list for fiction. And remember, there's always a place for you in the Enchanted Forest. Mm-hmm.